Okay, hey, CST 100 Cal Baptist students, this is your professor, Professor Jeff Evans. Sorry for the mess behind me. Um, we have been moving from our house to Upland to a home we bought in Riverside, and uh, this is the best I could do um, with moving stuff. So forgive the mess, but here's what I want to do. I want to... Um, I want to go through one of the first readings that you have. Remember, you go to learning activities and um, you hit week one, you go down, there's all those things you gotta do. So, when you hit the reading, the E100, go to that site, and I suggest just going to the site, printing up the list, okay? Um, it should be a two-page uh, uh, form. It looks like, a, like it's made to be a trifold. Um, just print that up. And um, then you've got the list ready to go each week. And on your left-hand column, you'll see it says day one all the way through day 100. So go to day one and see all the different passages. The first passage is Genesis 1-1. And those of you that are new to the Bible, Genesis is um, the very first book in the Bible. And let me just give you some background on what we're looking at, okay? So on this first lecture, this first... Um, section of scripture. <clears throat> the background is this. The author is Moses and he is going to be by the power of the Holy Spirit given what to record. But it is also possible that there was plenty of oral tradition passed down on what some of these stories fit together when it comes to Israel, Israelite history. So Moses isn't floating out in outer space as God is creating everything. That's not what's taking place. Nor is God sending down to Moses what took place. God is going to use Moses and his personality and in his culture and in his situation to record what he wants to be recorded for his people. Now, we're not the original audience. We're coming at this in the year 2020 in the middle of a pandemic. And so what we want to do is we want to apply science eyes to this passage. And that's okay, but we have to understand that's like putting science towards a love note or a love text or email that you've just received from someone who loves you. All right. Um, I've been married for 30 years. I've never applied science to a love note or a love text that my wife gave me. So look at this through the eyes of a relationship, okay? And understand this, with our science eyes, we want to look at these passages and we want to ask this question. We want to ask the question, how did God create? If God did create, how did he create? It's the wrong question. How is not the right question, because if God started to tell you, your brain would blow up, because we do not have the mind like God. We are creation. We are not creator, all right? It's like my dog, it's like me trying to explain to my dog, um, how do I, how does food keep reappearing in his food dish? He knows I scoop it out, and then I go over and put it in his dish. And he, he would, how do you do that? Well, I'd have to talk about money and a job and how do you get the money. You know what I'm talking about. So for us in an overview, here's what's happening. God created the heavens and the earth. He created Adam and Eve. They sinned. Once they sinned, God kicked them out of his garden. Basically, look, if you don't want to follow my rules in my garden with my provisions, then get your own garden. So, but that seems kind of cold. So not only did he do that, but he also provided a savior to fix the sin situation. And we'll look at that in this passage. But there's one creation. There's two creation stories. Let's go over that again. There's one creation. There's two stories about creation. There's one Jesus. There's four gospels that talk about Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'm looking at the camera. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Is there four Jesuses? No. One Jesus, four accounts, four stories, four eyewitnesses, four compilers of looking at the subject of Jesus. Moses, one author. God, one God. 
creations, one creation. Stories, two. And people try and how do we justify these together? That goes back to the question of how. The question that Moses is wanting to answer is not a question of how. He's wanting to answer the question of who. Because Now check this out. So after Adam and Eve sinned, they go off, they have children, there's this sin that happens, and but God is in the middle of wanting to redeem his people. And so we follow through, Adam and Eve have kids, they have kids, and so forth, so forth. We get to Noah, God's like, hey, there's too much sin, I'm wiping this out, I'm starting over with a new Adam, Noah and his family, because Noah would walk with God and was blameless in his sight. Keep going, going down. God then creates his own nation, his own people to show the world how he can love a certain people and how he wants to love then the whole world. So this people are going to be the people of Israel. Israel's a name for a guy. And so he's going to be loved. Down the road, though, all this nation of Israel is going to be stuck in Egypt for 400 years and be slaves to the Egyptians. They get rescued by the power of God through Moses. They go through the dry land underneath the Red Sea. God parts the sea. They walk across. God closes the sea, destroys the army, destroys their enemies. And God is showing them who he is. They don't know who he is. They've been in Egypt with multitude polytheistic gods. Gods for everything. In fact, each of the plagues that God brings destroys one of their gods. And their greatest god was Pharaoh himself. The last play was God destroying the firstborn son, who was the next Pharaoh. What is God doing? He's trying to show his people that he's greater than these Egyptian gods. So, bear with me. Moses is taking these people out of Egypt, called Israelites. They want to know, how did we... How did we come to be so loved by this God you say is our God, Yahweh? Who is this God? We know he's got power, but who is he? So, then Moses says, let me tell you who he is. And so he starts with the beginning. So now, here's how we're going to do this. This is a Bible class. Get your Bibles. Okay? If you don't have your Bible, that your ESV um, or an NLT, um, I would prefer, actually, if you have an NLT, to follow with me in my lectures and then do your study in your ESV study Bible. It'll work out fine. It's just the English. Okay, um, But I'm going to be using NLT. If you only have your ESV, that's fine. You'll, you'll get it. All right? But get your Bible. I want you to open your Bible and follow with me. Don't just listen to this because I want you to circle. I want you to circle some words, okay? So look, get your Bible. If you don't have it yet, push pause. Okay, now you have your Bible. All right, Genesis 1-1. Very first book, here we go. Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. What is Moses telling the people of Israel? He is writing and telling them that in the beginning, their God, Yahweh, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. Now, here's what's important. Look at the fourth word in verse 1. That word is God. G-O-D. If we understood the Hebrew and we were reading the Hebrew, it would say Elohim. That's the word for God, right? It's one name for God. Let's go back over it again. One Jesus, four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. One God, one people of Israel. Many names for God. One of them is Elohim. These different names of God describe who he is. That's what Moses is trying to show his people. Who is God? My name is Jeff. That's the name my parents gave me, Jeff Rey, R-E-Y. Now, you know me as Professor Evans, Professor Jeff, or you can just call me Jeff. My church calls me Pastor Jeff. 
and then someone would just call me Jeff. I'm not hung up on titles. However, the words themselves dictate who the person is. So for instance, I have six grandkids. My name to them is Papa. They don't call me Professor Jeff, okay? That's not gonna happen, all right? Even if they took my class down the road, they'd still raise their hand and say, Papa, that would be awesome. So, God is one God in three persons with many names. The first name we find here that Moses uses is Elohim, okay? So in your Bible, circle that word God, and then next to it write Elohim, E-L-O-H-I-I-M, Elohim. Here we go. So the earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep waters and the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Verse three, then God said, I want you to circle, said, let there be light and there was light. God saw that the light was good. Then he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. And evening passed and morning came, marking the first day. So Genesis one, verse three, circle, said, S-A-I-D. Verse 6. Circle the third word in verse 6. It is said. Then God said, let there be space between the waters to separate the waters of the heavens from the waters of the earth. And that is what happened. God made this space to separate the waters of the earth and the waters of the heavens. God called the space sky and evening passed and morning came, marking the second day. All right. So we have verse 3, God said. Verse 6, God said. Now we get to verse 9. Guess what's going to happen? You guys are sharp, sharp students. Here we go. Verse 9, third word, then God what? Said. Are you catching on to something here? Okay. Notice that in verse 1 and verse 2 and verse 3, 4, uh, 5, 6, seven, eight, and nine, all say G-O-D. Big G, little O, little D. Now you may be thinking, there's no, there's no big deal about how it's typed out. There's a huge deal on how it's typed out. Huge. We just read over it like we're reading, and we read God, G-O-D. The way the translators of the Hebrew to the English, how they put the typeset is important because it's as if we've got this whole group of scholars behind us and they know the Hebrew, we don't, we only know the English. And so, I mean, I took Hebrew, but I forgot it. Okay, so they're standing back behind us and they're saying, look, when I translated the Hebrew, the original, okay, the original lettering, okay, when I translated that, Here's what I want to make sure you understand is that I'm going to put it in some keys. G, big G, little O, little D is going to change in a moment. And when it does change, you need to understand something changed in the original language, the original way Moses had it written, the, original, the words and title for God. So the number one question that Moses is answering for his people is who is our God? We've seen him do these miracles. Now we're wandering in the desert, going to our promised land that we've never been to. Who is God? Take off your science eyes, and instead of asking, how did God make it? You don't have a brain to understand, neither do I. So let's look at the real question Moses is answering for his people. They wanna know who did all this. They understand gods. They've been in Egypt for all those gods. And so Moses is showing them. How is he showing God right now? Well, I've had you circle four, three words. Said, said, said. What do you think they're learning? I think they're learning that their God, who did this creating, he did it with words. God said, verse 3, let there be light. Verse 6, God said, let there be space between the waters to separate the waters of the heavens from the waters of the earth. Verse 9, then God, what? Said, let the waters beneath the sky flow together into one place so dry ground may appear. And that is what happened. God called the dry ground land and the waters seas and God saw that it was good. Verse 11, then God said, there's another circle, 
Okay, circle said, let the land sprout with vegetation, every sort of seed-bearing plant, trees that grow seed-bearing fruit. These seeds will then produce the kinds of plants and trees from which they came, and that is what happened. Verse 12, the land produced vegetation, all sorts of seed-bearing plants and trees, seed-bearing fruit. The seed produces plants and trees of the same kind, and God saw that it was good. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the third day. Verse 14, circle the third word, guess what it is? Said. Then God said, let lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. And let's go back. Let's go down to verse 20. Go to verse 20. Circle the third word. Then God said, let the waters swarm with fish and other life. Let the skies be filled with birds of every kind. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that scurries and swarms in the water and every sort of bird ever producing offspring of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God blessed them saying, be fruitful, multiply. Let the fish fill the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. This is a really good verse because I like sushi. And the Lord said, be fruitful fish, fill the seas. That's important. Gotta have that fish. Little eel sauce. Soy sauce, mm. some yellowtail, mm. verse 24, third word, guess what it is, said. Then God said, let the earth produce every sort of animal, each producing offspring of the same kind, livestock, small animals, this is what happened, he made all sorts of anim wild animals, livestock, small animals, and each able to produce offspring of the same kind, and God saw that it was good, verse 26. Then God <coughs> said, water break. Verse 26, God said, let the earth produce every sort of animal. I'm sorry, verse 26, God said, let us make human beings in our image. Now, circle said, verse 26, here it is, big G, little O, little D, God said, but notice this. Circle this, these couple words here. Circle us, let us make human beings in our image. God is saying, let us make human beings in our image. To be like us. It will rain over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, wild animals, the earth, small animals scurry along the ground. Interesting. Us is plural, our is plural. In the Hebrew, I had you spell Elohim, E-L-O-H. It's I-I-M, but then in English we make it I-M. So, I-M, im, is plural. That's plural. So, you know, books, S is plural, more than one book. Im is not more than one God, but single God, three persons. Now you're going, how does that happen? I don't know. It's a mystery. We use the term Trinity to nail that down. But here at the very beginning, before we even hear about Jesus and, and God's Son, or but we have heard of the Spirit. So we've heard of two, God the Father and God the Spirit, because in Genesis 1, 2, the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the water. This isn't God and his created beings, the angels. Uh, this is let us. So the Creator is one God in three persons. Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, wild animals in the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. It's verse 27. A summary verse. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and govern it. Rain over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and the animals that scurry along the ground. Verse 29, then God, key word again, verse, circle the third word, said, Look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food, and I have given every green plant food for all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, and the small animals that scurry along the ground, everything that has life. And, and that is what happened. Verse 31, then God looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was very good. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the sixth day. Chapter 2, verse 1. 
So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. Verse 4. This is the account of the creation of the heavens and the earth. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, whoa, 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 whoa. I thought we were going through how God was making the earth. Starts with, you know, the Spirit of God hovering over light and all of these things and the land and the water and the separation and the birds and everything we know of and then making people, man, woman in his image. We're cruising along, big G, little O, little D, God, Elohim, says, and everything is made. God said, God said, God said, God said. Now let's put it back to the Hebrew. Elohim said, Elohim said, Elohim said. What's the number one question that we're looking at? We're not looking at how things were made, even though we're getting an idea that he made this and this and this. We're not getting the molecular science of it. We're learning about who God is. What did we learn so far through this creation account, this creation story? Moses tells them that their God said the world into existence. That means that their God is so powerful and so mighty. He is almighty that he can speak things into existence. I can't do that. I can't speak and go cheeseburger and then there it is in my hand. If I could, now granted with the video if I was technically savvy I could figure out how to make a, t a burger go appear right there um, but I don't really know how to do that. God didn't need tech being savvy to do that but he is all powerful so he says it into existence and it happens. That is powerful. What are the Israelites learning from Moses about their God, Elohim? He is powerful. He is all-powerful. And all he has to do is say it, and things happen. Now, that's pretty incredible. But what that shows us is, since we can't speak things into existence, but God can, what happens is when we learn about who God is, it makes it feel like there's this distance. God's over here, and I'm lowly, and I'm over here. He is great. I am not. He speaks things in existence. I can't. So, now Moses gives them another story. But get this in your brain. I know we want to work chronological, okay? The Bible doesn't go from beginning to end chronologically. There's a beginning, and there's a continuing end. But in between is not chronological. It's going to have different pieces and we're going to put different pieces in order. Generally, it's flowing this way. Generally. Okay? But here right at the beginning, it doesn't work. Let's look. Genesis 2. So we get to verse 1, which we've already read. So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work, and God blessed the seventh day, and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. Verse 4, we get a whole new introduction. This is the account of the creation of the heavens and the earth. What? God already made the heavens and the earth. We're thinking chronological, though. Moses is going, I gave you the first story about who God is. He is, his name is Elohim. Now look at this, verse 4. Get your pen out. This is the account of the creation of the heavens and the earth. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Okay. Circle, Lord God. Now circle, made. In the first story, it was always God. Little, big G, little O, little D. What has changed? What has changed is now Moses says, when the Lord God, hmm, notice the word Lord. 
it's an English word, right? So if we were in Great Britain, you know, Lord Jeffrey, right? Okay, your name, okay, you're the Lord, you're the master. But this is different. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Then, big G, little O, little D. Again, the scholars behind us who know Hebrew are putting it in English and they're saying, look what happened. It's not when God made the earth, it's when the Lord God made. This isn't the scholars changing the scriptures in the English. This, that's not what's happening. This is having a copy of the Hebrew scrolls, which we've gotten before Jesus was born from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and we're going, what's the Hebrew say? The Hebrew says that the Lord God in this part. Well, what's that word Lord? It's Yahweh. Y-A-H-W-E-H. -E it's the holy word for God that even now, today, um, Jews will not say that word. Okay? They will change it to the word Adonai because they want to be... They want to be um, honoring to the Lord to not even say his name. Well, we're, we have a relationship with Jesus, and that's a whole other discussion about the difference between Jews and Jesus, but we'll get to it, okay? And Jews and believers in Jesus. Um, but what I want you to see here is, now write in your Bible, take your pen and write, Yahweh, Y-A-H-W-E-H, -E Yahweh Elohim. And notice this. Did Yahweh Elohim, did he say, did he said? It's not proper English, but did he said right there? No. What did he do? He made. Something's happening. Something's happening with Moses here. Before, we circled, God said, God said, God said, God said, God said, God said. Elohim said, Elohim said, Elohim said. Now we get to chapter 2, and all of a sudden, Moses is going, hey, this is the account of the creation of the heavens and the earth. I thought he already did that. He did. But one creation, two accounts. So this is where the chronology stops. He's get, let me Moses is saying, let me give you the first story that your God is all powerful. They need to know that because they've already seen that God is all powerful, rescuing them from the greatest nation on earth, the Egyptians, the Egyptian, all the pyramids and all of that stuff, okay? He rescued them from there. Now, to know that we just have a God who's powerful is not enough. Because we, don't, we, we need to know that our God is ultimately powerful and way out there. But we also need to know that God is close. He's intimate. And that he holds us. He cares for us. That's what happens now. So, we're gonna, first we saw that God said, super powerful. But now we're going to see that God is, not only is he extremely powerful, and separated from us. God looks down and he says things into existence. Now he is here with us. And notice this, when the Lord God made, that when you hear that word, what, what did you make, okay? It's your hands, your eyes, your mind, you mold, okay? That's intimate, that's close. Think of a, a mother, a newborn baby being in a mother's hands, okay? So now when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth. See how different this story is from the other one? For the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, had not yet sent rain to water the earth, and there were no people to cultivate the soil. Instead, springs came up from the ground and watered all the land. Verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. Circle this word, breathed. He breathed. God breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. We don't want to go to, how did he do it? We want to go to, who is God? Who is he? That's pretty intimate, that God breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils. Wow. We've heard of giving mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and 
and trying to help someone who can't take care of themselves and they're down on the ground and they're not breathing and you pump on their heart, okay, CPR, uh, that's a very intimate thing, you know, for a stranger to do that to another stranger. Look at how intimate we see God here. And it's not God, let me clarify, it. I screwed up. Lord God, Yahweh Elohim. So let's go over again, one God. He has a name Elohim, he has a name Yahweh Elohim, he also has another name Adonai, many names. So he's going to though, breathe the breath of life in the man's nostril. Now some of you are freaking out right now. You're going, wait a minute. Did he say it into existence or did he breathe life into us? Which one is it? That's your Western chronological scientific mind. Okay? This, this is Eastern. It's not Far East, okay? But it's Eastern. This isn't Western. This is Eastern mindset. We're Answer, Moses is answering the question for his people, who is God, not how did he create? The most important thing for us is not to know how did you do it, the most important thing is to know who did it, okay? Would you rather be able to be friends with and go over and have dinner with a famous artist? Um, or would you rather just read a book about how he did it? I don't know about you, I'd rather go to his house and and eat and drink and laugh and be able to go, I know these incredible artists. I know that band and that incredible, uh, that incredible worship band, that incredible band that's on TV and on the radio. Do you know how they make that music? Nah, I don't really care. I just know they make amazing music and I know them. And I enjoy their presence and they enjoy my presence. I don't even know how to play anything, but I know that band. You see what I'm saying? So, here the Lord God made, formed, breathed. Now look at verse 8. Genesis 2, verse 8. Then the Lord God planted, there again, hands, intimate, planted a garden in Eden and the east, and there he placed the man he had made. Verse 9, the Lord God made all sorts of trees grew grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which that's a big point. A river flowed from the land of Eden, watering the garden and then dividing into four branches. The first branch called the Pishon flowed around the entire land of Havilah where gold is found. The gold of that land is exceptionally pure. Aromatic resin and onyx stones are also found there. Why is Moses going on to this thing about gold and precious stones? His people, his original audience, saw tons of gold in Egypt, saw tons of precious jewels. They were the slaves for these incredibly wealthy people. They've seen gold. What is he doing? He's trying to connect them to what they know. And what they know is what they have seen in their slavery in Egypt. So God, Moses is trying to connect with them to their God. And, and what they're also learning is that their God is wealthy, far more wealthy than the Egyptian gods. Let's go on to verse 15. The Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over him. But the Lord God warned him, warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. What a great deal. I'm going to make a garden. You're going to be provided for. You're going to have everything you owe you ever need. You're going to live here for eternity. There is no sin. There are no problems. There is no disease. Everything is great. You can eat whatever you want. Tell you what, I just don't want you to eat from that one tree. Okay? Cool? All right. That's it. Now, some of you are thinking, well, if God was so kind, why would he put the tree there? Ah. I love my wife, Margaret. You know why? Not because she was forced to be my wife. She chose to love me. All the four billion men in the world, she chose me. I love that. God wants his people to choose him. Now you might be thinking, that seems really weird. Well, that's because we are creation and not creator. God wants to be worshipped. He wants to be loved. By definition of being God, he should be worshipped. He should be loved. 
So, he puts a tree in there and says, don't, don't eat from that. Now, I have three kids, I have six grandkids, all my kids are grown and married and away from the home, but when they were little, um, if I told them, don't, don't do that, don't do that, don't touch that, and then if I watched them as little toddlers and they went over and they looked at it, but then they didn't touch it and they walked away, what happened in me? Not them, what happened in me? I felt very proud that they listened to me and they valued my words and they didn't touch it. Now, maybe it was something that was very dangerous. Well, that makes me feel really good because I don't want them to be getting hurt. But in this situation, I'm, I'm, I am loving them because our relationship is growing. They're understanding that I care for them and that my words are important to them to not touch something. Well. God has put everything out there for them to enjoy, except one tree. Well, you know what happens. Adam chooses, Eve chooses, they choose to do their own thing. And that's really what sin is. What's the middle letter, the vowel, in the word sin? It's I. That's where the problem is with sin. It's always with I. I want to do this. I want to do that. As a creation, I want to be powerful like the Creator. That's sin. I don't want to be submissive to Him. And that's exactly what Adam and Eve did. And that's my great grandpa, Adam. And I'm just like him, and so are you. So let's look at this. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. Verse 16, the Lord warned him. Verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed the ground from the ground, all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky, he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. Guess what the Hebrew word is for man here? The Hebrew word is Adam, A-D-A-M. Adam. Verse 20, he gave Adam, he gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky and all the wild animals, but still there was no helper just right for him. 21, so the Lord God, there again, caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, this one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called a woman because she was taken from man. This, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Now the man and the wife and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. Genesis 2, verse 25. Now that concludes your part of your reading for day, your day, uh, in your week, okay? Day one, you're supposed to read day one through day 10. That concludes part of your reading. Now, I don't want to sum this up. Let's sum it up by looking and saying this. The number one question was, Moses, God wants Moses to show his people who he is. And he starts off with showing them his power, that he can he said the things in his existence. But he also wants to show them he is also incredibly intimate, that he, Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, formed, breathed, planted. And that the Lord God loves us, and that he gave man a woman. And notice what God used. He used part of a, a rib. The ribs cover the heart. And that's just to show us that the man and the woman, there's this equality there between man and woman, the covering of the heart. God didn't take part of his toe and make the woman. No, he took the most intimate part, his heart. He took part of that rib, the covering, the covering of the heart. And that's exactly what we do in marriage. We cover each other's hearts and we love each other. We become one flesh. So, um, that concludes our lecture over Genesis 1 uh, through verse uh, chapter 2, verse 25. And I hope that helps you understand because it's important that we wrap this all up, that this very first reading is all about God and his relationship to man and how wonderful God is and how stupid we are that we sin. That happens in chapter 3. You'll read that. That's part of your reading. And you'll see how they screw up and how they... They fall away, but notice that God has a plan to rescue them. Why? He's a loving God. He's a loving Heavenly Father. 
students. So let me close a prayer. Lord Jesus, help my students, help your students uh, with this reading and understanding. Help us to, to understand that you are loving and kind and that you care about us and that, Lord, you gave Moses the words that you wanted him to give his people that he loved so that they could be a blessing to the rest of the world. And they have. We are blessed because of the message that Moses gave his people. And so, Father, thank you, Lord, that you love us and that you are God, that you are Elohim, but that you are intimate. You are Yahweh Elohim. You are Lord God, and you care about us, and we love you. I pray, Lord, you bless my students, your students, uh, for the rest of these eight weeks. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, get on with that reading.